Welcome to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, president of the Local 237 Teamsters. Joining me once again is the District Attorney of Brooklyn, Charles Hines. Welcome to Reaching Out once again. Good to be with you, Greg. Thank you very much for the invitation. Local 237 represents peace officers, school safety agents, mm -hmm. uh, hospital police officers in particular, uh, CUNY campus peace officers. Mm -hmm. And you've been very instrumental in helping our law enforcement Mm -hmm. especially in Brooklyn, and you established a program for school safety, mm -hmm. uh, and I want you to speak about that. But before you speak about that, I want to let you know that's why Local 237 endorsed you, because you are looking out for our membership. Good. Thank, I really appreciate that. And, look, it's very simple to me. Anybody in law enforcement, at whatever uh, assignment, puts themselves at risk each and every day. Uh, what makes them different, and I, I speak as a former New York City Fire Commissioner, is that they don't know when they leave home uh, to start a tour of duty whether they're going to come home uninjured or come home at all. And it seemed to me that that uh, your folks in school safety and, and in the other related uh, security assignments deserve the protection, the same protection we give to members of the NYPD, members of the fire department. So what I've done, Greg, and I'm very, very proud of this, is that uh, I've, I've been um, in the forefront of getting special legislation to protect virtually every uniform force in this, in this uh, city. So one of the reasons why the uniform fi uh, sanitation workers endorsed me uh, a couple of months ago, um, they, they deserve the protection uh, that society uh, has to offer. And uh, as long as I'm district attorney, I'm going to make very, very sure if you hurt uh, uh, one of your members, you're going to pay a serious price. I'm glad you uh, brought that up and glad you said that because we have one more segment of our membership, that unfortunately, needs to be placed in that category, mm -hmm. uh, the same as bus drivers. Mm -hmm and um, traffic enforcement agents, right. and that's our New York City Housing Authority employees because mm -hmm. the uh, rise in assaults have occurred over the last mm -hmm. few years, and right. we are seeking legislation mm -hmm. in that area also. And you'll have my support. Thank you very much. It means a lot. Uh, you've introduced a number of programs in the district attorney's office in addition to the traditional work of prosecuting accused criminals. I would like you to share information about some of them. Uh, the first one is please tell us about the program you call Palm Alert for Community and Law Enforcement Resources Together. Let me give you a quick, quickly the background. When I had the privilege of becoming DA in 1990, there were 158,000 serious felonies in Brooklyn. Uh, we had one out of every 15 of our residents was the victim of a serious crime. Uh, we had uh, a murder rate of 760 a year. And we had become the fifth most violent place in America per capita. And the reason for that was a drug-driven uh, crime wave. Uh, and we had it all wrong. We were sending everybody to prison under the Rockefeller drug laws, irrespective of whether they were drug addicts or not. And I, I changed that dramatically. And we can talk about that another time. And the other one was that 3,000 folks come back from prison each and every year. And the national average is 6 out of 10 uh, reoffend within three years of release, and of course, uh, with uh, with uh, that kind of statistic, uh, with no support, with no um, structure, um, uh, the the inevitable is predictable. And so, uh, my first assistant at the time, uh, who you know, I'm sure, Patricia Gatling, is the yes. chair of the Human Rights Commission, came up with a, a great idea. She said, if we could offer these folks, the formerly incarcerated. Um, uh, uh, wraparound services, get their identity restored. Mo most of them have only a prison identity. Get them Medicaid. Um, give them interview skills, uh, resume writing skills. Give them uh, computer skills. Give them transitional employment. Give them GEDs because many of them have dropped out from high school. Uh, and then prepare them for a permanent uh, work experience. Maybe we could reduce this reoffending rate. And I thought it was a great idea. Now, you know, I've spoken to prosecutors across the country who said, you know, why would you get involved with a bunch of felons? I said, because they've, they've served their sentence. 
they're entitled to respect and they're entitled to be given an opportunity to join uh, society again. But more importantly, it's about public safety. If I can reduce the reoffending rate of this uh, group of folks, I'm going to affect directly the safety of the people that I represent. So that's the argument I've always used. As a Christian Catholic, I believe it's also my obligation to save people if I can. But it's been immensely successful. Bruce Weston of Harvard University conducted a 22-month study, and he found that our re- reduction rate, or re- reoffending rate, I should say, is 2 out of 10 rather than 6 out of 10. I'm convinced if I uh, am reelected for my next term that I can drive that down to 1 out of 10, maybe fractions as well. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a program that has not been replicated uh, as our drug program has been replicated. But um, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm confident as a result of the, of the fact that a very, very conservative fellow in Fayetteville County, uh, Kentucky, whose motto for his office is catch and release is for fish, not felons, he has a reentry program. Now that's, you remember Richard Nixon going to China. Yes. If a prosecutor like Ray Lawson from Fayetteville County, Kentucky, can understand the benefits of reentry, uh, I don't think we're very far away from the time when every prosecutor will adopt them, just that every pro- prosecutor in this country has adopted uh, our drug treatment program. You're listening to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd. Our very special guest is uh, Brooklyn District Attorney Charles Hines. And you mentioned the Rockefeller drug law. Yeah. And you said we'll talk about that another time. Let's talk about that now. Sure, Because you, you sure. brought it up, and of I want to hear your role in uh, that. You know, I, I used to be a criminal defense lawyer. I started my career as a legal aid lawyer, and then I was in private practice representing folks. And it used to really offend me to walk out of the courtrooms in the five counties, shaking my head that some young prosecutor thought they were going to make their career on the, on the backs of uh, the back of my client, who happened to be a drug addict. There was no drug treatment anywhere. Under the Rockefeller drug laws, there was no distinction made for someone who was uh, 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 possessing drugs for their, to, to feed this horrible habit. There was no distinction made for those who even sell small amounts of drugs just to, protect, to, uh, uh, to help their habit along. It was all about you know, everyone goes to jail. It was morally repugnant. It was fiscally unsound. It cost an awful lot of money. And it didn't work. I mean, it, the, the, uh, we, we had become a dangerous society as a result of this revolving door of drug addicts going to prison, spending their time, coming back to the same environment with no treatment and, and getting re- and reoffending. And so we created the Drug Treatment Alternative to Prison. It's known nationally as DTAP, the acronym. When I put DTAP in place, no jurisdiction in this country had drug treatment save for Dade County, which is Miami. And it was a drug court there. And it was a, a trailblazing idea. But no prosecutor in this country uh, had embraced drug treatment as an alternative to prosecution. They thought that they would be charged with being soft on crime, which is, as I viewed it, ludicrous. Today, we have 148 drug courts in New York State. There isn't a prosecutor in this country that doesn't have either a drug court or some other form of drug treatment. So it's one of the things of which I'm most proud that I was able to uh, act as a, a role model for for the uh, other prosecutors in this country. I recently learned about a change with the initiative of yours created for mothers who are accused of crimes mm-hmm. called Justice Homes. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about that newly created program? It's a great idea, and some people might find it sound pretty odd that the Women's Prison Association would approach a prosecutor. But, you know, they know of the work I, I'm involved in. It's great. The easiest thing I do is put people in jail. That does not take a lot of intellect. The, the real struggle is trying to get prevention programs, trying to get intervention programs, and, of course, when people are coming home from prison to uh, interact with them as well, all in the, in the, with the goal of public safety. Women's Prison Association was given a half a million dollar grant by the Bloomberg administration to create Justice Home, to allow uh, mothers typically to stay with their children, to have a job, to have either part-time employment and part-time education or a full-time job or a full-time education. But critical to the program, 
to staying at, that they would be able to stay home with their children. And when it was presented to me, it didn't take me more than a second to say, I'm on board. I think it's a great idea. Uh, I've had another uh, program which had a similar design. It's called Drew House, where I have five families, typically a mom and two kids, living in five apartments in Crown Heights. And that program was validated by the Columbia School of Nursing and found to be exceptionally um, successful. Not a single one of our 12 women uh, reoffended. Uh, the cost of the program was $36,000 for mom and two kids. The cost of putting mom in prison and putting the two kids in foster care, $129,000. Justice Home will be um, uh, overseen by case managers from the Justice, uh, fr from the Women's Prison Association. They needed a prosecutor as their partner, and I signed on right away. And what we'll, we will do is that we will identify 45 women, mostly mothers, and they will plead guilty uh, and have a, uh, a, a, a sentence of six months to, to uh, four years hanging over their head. And then they'll be given the, the services of this case manager. And so um, over a year to a year and a half, uh, when all those services are rendered to these people, I'm very, very confident that we're going to see low reoffending rates as we saw in Drew House. But most importantly, Greg, most importantly, as, a, as the, a father of five kids and a grandfather of 16, wow. those children will not suffer the sometimes irreversible trauma of watching helplessly while mom goes off to prison. And even worse than that is that the data is clear. A kid who watches mom or dad go, up, go off to prison years later will follow them through the prison door. So this, again, is another public safety um, initiative that I, I see exciting replication and expansion over the next four years if I'm reelected as district attorney. Well, hopefully you get a chance to continue this great work that you're doing over the next four years. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this segment of Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237, a very special guest running for re-election, District Attorney of Brooklyn, Charles Hines. Great to be Thank with you, Greg. Thank you very much. 